Hi, it's Tuesday night. Tonight marks two months, two months since we've been in quarantine, two months of figuring out this new normal. As we grow in resilience and determination, thinking through how it is that we're going to keep going in this, I've been thinking about why it is that doubts keep creeping in, why the thoughts persist that we're not sure that he's good, that he loves us, or that he's going to provide for us. We're not at all confident that Jesus is up to the challenge that we're facing now. I thought I would share with you from two passages very close together in Mark's Gospel, from Mark chapter 6 and then in Mark chapter 8. The passage in Mark 6 tells the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The passage in Mark 8 tells the story of Jesus feeding the 4,000, both incredible, amazing miracles of Christ. But then what happens at the end of the second feeding is even more important because that in and of itself reveals the disciples' hearts and our hearts. Because what I think is going on um, in these texts and in our lives is we struggle to believe that Jesus is who he is. We struggle to believe that he's good and he's in control. So how do we get there? How is he inviting us to this life of faith in the time of COVID? I think the life of faith is inevitably challenging to us, isn't it? Why? Let's look first at this, uh, the feedings that Jesus does. Jesus asks us first to look beyond our circumstances. The life of faith is challenging because it calls us away from our circumstances. In chapter 6, verse 37, he says, you give them something to eat. In chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, he says, they haven't eaten for three days. If I send them away, they'll faint. First, he explicitly, and second, he implicitly says to the disciples, you take care of it. What can you do? What can you do to fix this? And I think what Jesus is asking us there is, To what extent do we like to rely on the muscle of faith? Or to what extent at that point are we just like, I'm out. I'm going to despair and freak out. See, when Jesus says that uh, the life of faith is challenging to our circumstances, he's saying that's because all we're looking at is our circumstances. Because he's saying that all we care about is what we know and how we respond. You see, what, what they respond when Jesus says this is they say, Should we go buy 200 denarii worth of bread? Come on, Jesus. They're saying it almost sarcastically. Later in the chapter 8, he says, How can we do this? How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? So in the first case, they look to their money. We don't have near enough money. Second place, they look to their location. We're in the wrong place. And what are they not looking at, of course, is Jesus. Now let's think about that. When we're stuck in our circumstances, when we choose not to look with the eyes of faith up toward Jesus, what do we say? These debts are too big. These bills are too high. The tension in my house is too great. The stress, too much. When our circumstances win, we're saying, I don't know how I can do another day of homeschooling. I don't know if I can do another day of Zoom calls all day long. And to all of these circumstances, Jesus is saying, well, to what extent are you relying upon your faith? your faith in yourself, your faith in your circumstances, your problem solving, your abilities. See, he asks us not just to look beyond our circumstances, but to look beyond ourselves. Notice how he does this. In chapter 6, verse 38, he says, "Um, how many loaves and fish do you have? Go and see. In chapter 8, he says, "Um, so how many loaves do you have? Again, Jesus, of course, knows the answers to these questions. But after they've said, we don't have enough money and we're in the wrong place, he still says, so what do you have? What can you bring to bear on this seemingly impossible situation? A really challenging family situation, really challenging financial situation, really challenging time with your kids or at work. And he's saying, to what extent then Are you willing again to just double down and look to yourself and not look to him? You see, Jesus is asking us, of course, in faith to look to him to do the impossible. It's saying, can you trust me to feed these people? Do you know who you're dealing with? And they're clearly saying, we don't think that Jesus is who he has said he is. We're not sure that he could fix this or figure this out. All we can think about, it's all we can think 
is money and dollars, cents and geography and stores and budgets. You see, the life of faith is challenging. It's challenging because all we want to do is look at our circumstances and then we want to take control. We want to explain, we want to excuse, we want to rationalize. And then when that doesn't work, we just want to look to ourselves and get exasperated and angry and frustrated and irritable. Isn't that kind of the pathos of COVID-19? Some of you know that we're beginning to really explore uh, how we re-phase public worship. We're talking about how do we re-engage in this phase one, phase two, phase three? How do we do that per the governor's instructions? Well, I worked a lot last week on how we were going to try to phase in, and we talked about groups of 50 or 100, and we began to do some great planning. And then on Friday, the governor said, well, on second thought, don't worry about 50s, 100s. Let's just go straight to half of your sanctuary capacity. And, you know, that's, that's an interesting challenge, uh, a different problem for which to solve. But our problem is compounded a bit by the fact that our building's being torn down and our sanctuary will be unusable. And in that moment, what I began to feel on that Friday was a great amount of anxiety, just a whole lot of stress. And I thought, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? How can I manage this situation? How am I going to think, plan, type, persuade my way out of this situation? Because at no time after the governor's announcement on Friday did I think, you know, Lord, I'm really going to need you to fix this. I'm really going to need you to heal this. You love your church a whole lot more than I love this church. I mean, I didn't do that. I was in total problem-solving mode, which of course led me to total despair mode. Is it never going to get better? We're never going to be able to get back together. How are we going to worship again? Well, if those are some of the challenges to this life of faith. Those are some of the reasons why we struggle to believe that he's good and that he's strong. How do we get there? How does he invite us to a life of faith? And I think the invitations to faith are equally compelling. You notice how he, he, he asks us to, to look away from ourselves first. I didn't tell you the story of... Um, what happened after the second healing? Uh, this is not the second healing, the second feeding. After the second feeding, I mean, 5,000, 4,000 unbelievable miracles, and they get in a boat with Jesus. This is again in chapter 8. But it says they had forgotten to bring bread with them. They had only one loaf with them in the boat. So Jesus again begins teaching, and they begin to think, not what is Jesus teaching us about, but what have we not done? And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Now think about that. They're in a, a, a boat with Jesus. Jesus who's just made thousands and thousands of people satisfied through his miraculous provision. And they think, oh, we forgot the bread. They go to a place of shame. They go to a place of inadequacy. And, and notice what Jesus does here. Jesus then asks them five questions. Listen to the five questions Jesus asks. Jesus said, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? <clears throat> Excuse me, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? Five questions. And in all five questions, he's like, what's going on, y'all? I just did this miracle, and then I did another miracle, and you're with me, the same one that did the miracles, and you're worrying about me not having enough bread or you not being adequately prepared? And Jesus asks in these five rhetorical questions, have you lost your mind? Pulling a little Stanley there, aren't I? He's saying, have you forgotten who it is that you're in the boat with, who it is that fed you see, we've forgotten about his provision, of course. What does that reveal? What does that reveal about us? He's saying, in this perspective, you've lost sight of me. You're in a boat and you have one loaf and you've lost all perspective on who it is that's provided for you, who it is that's guiding you. It's the Lord, the King of the universe, who makes bread and fish appear out of nowhere. But that perspective also leads to hope. Because remember, he's saying, don't you see as you look back all that I've done? 
Remember, the disciples hadn't yet seen the crucifixion. They hadn't yet seen the resurrection. They hadn't seen the ascension of Christ, but we, by faith, have. And he's saying to us and our struggles and our circumstances, don't you see all that I've done for you already? Compare what you're going through with the weight of sin, with the ultimate pain of death, with the finality of the tomb, with your sins being held against you. And against all those obstacles, he says, I died for it. I was raised for it. Now I reign again for you. He's saying that should give you hope, that perspective. But he, he calls us not just to look beyond ourselves, of course. He calls us to look to his character. That's the undergirding strength of these stories. Notice the character that Jesus reveals. In verse 34 of chapter 6, he said, When he saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them. In chapter 8, in the beginning, verse 1, saw the crowd gathered nothing to eat. Verse 2, I have compassion on the crowd. See, Jesus cares about us in our inadequacy. Jesus cares about us in our inability. They're just listening. They're hanging on. Maybe they just want a meal. Maybe they don't really believe. It doesn't matter. He said, I want to feed you. I want to care for you. What you're going through matters to me. And it matters to all of you, to all 5,000, to all 4,000. He's saying, I'm not just interested in like my 12. Let me make sure my people get taken case. All of you. All of you. Now think about that extent of compassion. Think about how there are no strings attached to that. Think about the grace that's flowing from that. But it's not just his compassion, of course. We see the provision. You notice that Jesus shows up. And when he comes and feeds the 5,000, he says that 12 basketfuls were left over. And then when he feeds the 4,000, the text tells us that seven basketfuls were left over. And Jesus, of course, needs to remind him of this. Remember after he says, have you forgotten who you're in the boat with? Later in chapter 8, he says, um, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? See, Jesus does have to remind them. I will provide and I will satisfy you. I am the one that brings satisfaction. And no hot bath or warm shower, no raise, no promotion, no Netflix, no great supper, no nothing can satisfy you like he can. And Jesus is saying, I'm in the business of satisfying. I delight to satisfy you. And you know why I satisfy you? Just because I love you. Just because I delight to provide in your inadequacy, in your self-absorption, with your lack of faith. He doesn't say, listen, y'all pull it together, then I'm going to feed you. Y'all believe, sign up, you got it. Doesn't do any of that. It's the grace upon grace. But you notice how he concludes this. Do you not yet understand. And I've just been clinging to that word yet. Because what he's promising there is full understanding. That though now we see in part, one day we will see in full. Though now we see as through a glass dimly, one day we will see with eyes and behold his glory fully. See, the promise for us in this time of uncertainty, of struggle, of stress, of pain, is that Jesus is strong, but he's more than strong, he's good. And so this week, he is inviting me to trust again. Do you trust me with your church? Do you trust me that I can take care of public worship? Do you trust me with the demolition of your building? You don't have to fix this. You do have to pray. You don't have to solve this. You do have to trust me. And to my faithless eyes, to my wandering heart, the one that just wants to plan and fix and type, he says, look up, look up. I'm here and I love you and I will provide all that you and the church need both now and forever. And one day we will fully understand, even as we're fully understood, all for his glory. I sure miss seeing you. I can't wait to see you back when we are worshiping publicly, safely, but until then, know that uh, I continue to pray for and with you, and I really do love you, church.